Right. Uh, may I introduce our next uh, witness who is going to be joining us virtually uh, on Skype, and that's uh, Dr. Thomas Lee, who is the Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. He also chairs the editorial board of uh, Harvard Heart uh, Letter, which is a publication he helped to, to found. Uh, he recently taken a new role, a new position, the Chief Medical Officer of Press Ganey. And uh, with great privilege to uh, have you here, Dr. Lee. We thought you might still be in your bedroom, but you're up and running and fresh, and, uh, and, uh, and I could see you in your office. So I'm very grateful for taking the time uh, to help our thinking in relation to the London Commission. And I know you've got the brief about this, which is, uh, which is great. You probably cannot see us, but uh, very briefly, just to introduce the four colleagues with me here. Uh, we have Councillor Theresa O'Neill from London. We have Dr. Andy Mitchell, who is responsible. Well, he's the clinical leader for NHS England in London. And uh, we have Professor Dermot Kelleher, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine. And Nick Raceford, who is the uh, Member of Parliament, a senior Member of Parliament, who has been involved in a number of other commissions uh, in the past. So thank you for being with us. And I just wondered, you know, you know something about the UK's healthcare, and uh, the good and some of the challenges. And I wondered whether you would share with us some of your thoughts uh, and then maybe we can have a few, uh, few questions and a few points of discussion. I'll hand it over to you. Well, I'm, thr I'm thrilled that she's to do so. And, uh, I actually, uh, I would add a little unprepared remark in that in my new role, I actually focus on patient experience quite a bit. And if you wanted to turn our discussion back toward that topic and how things are evolving in the United States in, in ways that might be relevant, you know, I'd be happy to go there. Thank you. Uh, but I thought I would start uh, uh, very aware that I don't have frontline perspectives on your data or frontline perspectives on your opportunities and challenges, uh, but I, I thought I would give you some comments from afar, uh, the perspective of someone who does watch London and does watch the N NHS. And I would begin by, uh, by focusing on some themes that my colleague Michael Porter and I use when we studied the, when we discussed the case study that's written at Harvard Business School about the London Stroke Initiative. Uh, we use that case study to emphasize certain themes that I'm sure you're well aware of, but I'm hoping that you'll emphasize as you lay out your next set of work. Now, I know you're all just very proud of this work and, uh, and the number of the people here and uh, who you've been listening to in the hearings have played very direct, crucial roles in it. Uh, and that you know how difficult it was and you know how difficult it is proving to replicate and extend. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that when we discussed this case, and I was involved in teaching this case two separate times at Harvard Business School, in the last three weeks alone, uh, the three themes that we emphasize and with great admiration are, the first is that the initiative was driven by data and the needs of the population and you didn't surrender to politics as almost surely would have happened here in the United States, at least to the extent that we can tell from afar. It's an extraordinarily data-driven, needs-driven uh, initiative. The second, is that you were able to consolidate volume at a small number of sites that were located where they could serve the population. And the third theme is at those sites, real teams were created and enhanced, something that could only become possible because of the volume consolidation. You know, those three themes, which are very much uh, resonant with uh, the framework for uh, value uh, oriented healthcare that Michael Porter and I have written about, and uh, and Michael <laughs> Michael will be in the UK this week talking about. Um, you know, we think that the London Stroke Initiative is uh, a great 
great, maybe even the best example of some of those themes. And whenever I teach that case, I always pause and I ask, is there anyone in the room who can think of anything in medicine that has reduced 30-day mortality by 25 to 30 percent or more? And I pause for a long time because no one ever can. Uh, it is one of the great stories of modern medicine that you've accomplished there in the last several years. When I taught the case two weeks ago, I overheard one Harvard student turn to a UK student and say, this is phenomenal. And then adding a little later, this could never happen in the United States. I hope the latter is not true, but certainly it is phenomenal. So you have our respect and you have our envy and I'd be delighted if uh, you earned even more. Now with those themes, there are some obvious targets. And I, again, I don't know the data and opportunities the way you do, but the obvious broad themes, uh, I would list three, are cancer care. I think there is a good increasing evidence in, from that I see here in the United States that when you concentrate cancer in, in institutions that are completely focused on cancer with teams of clinicians, physicians and non-physicians really working together to improve outcome and to do so efficiently, uh, the results can be better survival as well as a lower cost per year of life earned for the patient. Mental health care, very challenging. I know there are very thoughtful people in the UK who have been working on this problem. It is a code that has not been cracked anywhere as yet, uh, but certainly it is a problem worth taking on. And then the third are chronic disease care in general. Like, and I thought that rather than have me give some big grand vision, you might go online, as I'm sure some of your staff have, and read the proposed legislation that was just issued last week, or perhaps it was the week before, from Senator Ron Wyden, W-Y-D-E-N, um, Democrat of Oregon. Uh, his office has put together a bipartisan effort. Yes, there actually are some bipartisan efforts that are flying below the radar screen here in the United States uh, to fund and uh, fund a program that will drive patients with chronic disease to providers that are, have organized programs that will take good and efficient care. In effect, our version of the London Stroke Unit for chronic disease, and it's fairly fully uh, envisioned in the draft legislation, and you can go to Senator Wine's website uh, to get the details. Now, I know from my visits and conversations with friends in the UK uh, that there are probably real opportunities with those consolidation and team building themes in primary care at the UK. I know it's daunting to change the structure by which physicians have organized their lives, uh, but I do know that many of the GP practices are really very small businesses and don't have the scale needed to develop real teams for prevention and chronic disease management. Uh, I do think that if anyone can start this difficult redesign, um, it's the City of London. And, uh, and I'm hoping that you will be teaching us as you do so. Um, I'll just close by quoting my friend and colleague, Atul Gawande, who has said that the, the last century was the highest value of medicine was autonomy, and that was okay because there wasn't that much to know or, or do. But this is a century where so many people must work together. It has to be the century of the system. So with that goal in mind, the themes of consolidation and team building and giving teams what they need, the data, the financial and non-financial rewards, uh, that is what I'm hoping that we'll see in the next phase of your work and the rest of the world will learn from it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, these wise words uh, and uh, I'm just going to ask some of my colleagues uh, to seek your advice. Just the last point that you said, 
uh, which did come up this morning as well. You know, one thing I learned in, when I was in Parliament is this concept of collective accountability. I don't know how they do it. Intermittently it fails, may I just say. It doesn't really work all the time in politics. But uh, how, how, what, what have you done in the U.S. to introduce this concept of collective accountability? Uh, you can put a team together, but if you don't have that collective accountability through it, it doesn't work. Any, any advice on that before we move on? Uh, you know, our connection isn't fantastic at my end in terms of sound. You're using elective accountability? You Co mean collective. Collective, not collective elected. Yeah. Accountability. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and, and that is one of the aspects of the London Stroke Initiative which have made us so jealous and the reason why so many people in the United States react to the story and say, fantastic, I can't see us doing it here. And, and when I ask my colleagues here in the United States, uh, why couldn't we do this here in Boston, for example, you know, where you know, we have you know, renal transplant programs at the two teaching hospitals and partners healthcare system three miles apart. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we don't have as much sense of collective responsibility as you. You know, we, you know, we don't have a commission for the city of Boston with the city of New York that's doing the work that you're doing now. Now that said, I think that having a, a, a group that's politically uh, charged with responsibility is one thing, but you do need the data to drive it. And collect, so collecting outcomes data and collecting cost data, I think do more, you know, are absolutely necessary, uh, but not sufficient. You need the leadership as well. Thank you. Uh, Andy. Tom, this is uh, Andy Mitchell, Medical Director of the Regional Office. Can I go back to the first point that you made about patient experience, if I can, because you've clearly got an interest in that, and that's some of your, that's your current uh, work. Um, doctors' involvement in patient experience and promoting patient experience, quite often doctors don't engage with that aspect of quality uh, as they ought. Have you made, how have you approached that with your clinicians particularly? You know, I'm afraid that the, the connection is erratic. In terms of sound, but could could you re come closer to the microphone? Repeat this more slowly. Yes, my my question relates to patient experience because you're clearly doing work on that at the moment, and quite often it's the case that doctors, in particular, don't engage with improving patient experiences. They might. And what incentives have you used to ensure that they do? Because I think that's some of the key to our current problems. Uh, yes, and you know there is. Uh, you know, I made my move to press gain. You know, the, the, the company, the company that measures patient experience, because I believe that it, it, it was the timing was right. It was becoming something very, very important. And you know, the the realization that I think is sweeping through healthcare in the United States, and I do think sweeping is a, is an appropriate word, is that you know, is that uh, we've had so much medical progress. There's so many people involved in the care of patients now that we've crossed some kind of inflection point where the care can be chaotic for even routine conditions. And that for patients who have complicated conditions or undiagnosed conditions, that it can be torture. And one of the, one of the I'm embarrassed to say, one of the reasons why we feel like we've crossed an inflection point is the realization that even patients who are you know connected you know patients who are family members of physicians and administrators in our hospitals we cannot guarantee that they won't have a miserable experience so that when a crisis comes home then suddenly it becomes an important crisis so mike you know, my colleagues are increasingly using the term suffering instead of patient experience. We're talking about suffering from disease, suffering from treatment, and suffering from dysfunction of the delivery system. Though there is going to be some suffering in healthcare, uh, there's going to be anxiety, but there's suffering and there's unnecessary suffering. And so we are breaking down the measures of patient, formerly called patient experience, to capture things like the anxiety, the lack of trust, 
you know, the, the, the confusion of what's going to happen next. You know, we are finding, you know, I've just finished a big analysis with a million patient data set showing that what matters to patients in terms of their likelihood of recommending providers, the number one thing is how much confidence they have in the caregiver, particularly the physician. The number two thing is how well coordinated they feel that the care is. And the number three thing is did they feel like their concerns were being listened to. And after you take those three things into account, we actually found that waiting time did not matter. It did not add additional information to our ability to predict patients' likelihood of recommending a doctor or recommending a facility to their patients. So the coordination of care, you know, showing patients that it's coordinated as well as actually coordinating it, we're, be, we're realizing this is care. This is care patients want because patients are afraid. They're afraid of their diseases, but they're also increasingly afraid that we are not talking to each other and that something may be slipping through the cracks because of the chaos that they can see around us. Thank you, Tom. Um, another brief question for me. Uh, it's a slightly different topic. We, you've talked about volume and outcome relations, and we've made quite a lot. Of, we've made very good progress with stroke and trauma, with complex vascular surgery, and with some cancers. But beyond that, it becomes very difficult to be sure that there is a sound case for further centralisation. And much of what presents to A&E services is, is, is non-specific or chronic disease related. Do, are, is there anything further, any other conditions that we should be looking to centralise beyond that, or will we have to accept the reality? that a lot will have to be still catered for in district hospitals? You know, I, I do think there's real opportunity with chronic disease. Obviously, you won't be concentrating it at eight sites in, for the City of London. Uh, but if you look at the legislation from Senator Wyden's office, which I made a very small contribution toward developing, uh, the idea of chronic disease programs where there are teams of physicians, but non-physicians as well, who are organized to meet most of the needs of patients with chronic disease and to do so as efficiently as possible. Uh, it's, you know, imagine a hypercute stroke team for diabetes, you know, with, which, you know, it won't have the speech therapist and the, the occupational therapist, but it will have the podiatrist and it will have a nephrologist and, and so on. Um, uh, those kind that extend the same principle and understand you're not going to do that care everywhere. It's not going to be done in every office. It will be done in some geographically dispersed uh, set of programs and there will be incentives for patients and providers to go there. Uh, uh, I think that the chances are, it seems very logical that this should produce uh, better care and also do so more efficiently. Thank you, John. That's very um, helpful. Thank you. Yes, Dermot. Uh, Dermot Kelleher, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College, and uh, I'm very interested in your, in your writings in this area, and uh, particularly the, uh, the shift from <coughs> service-based uh, to uh, outcomes-based uh, uh, delivery. And I just wonder if, if you could uh, elaborate on, on, on how, particularly how you use these case models and how you think that we should be educating the next generation of care deliverers in, uh, in, in, in a more formal uh, team-based setting or in a, towards the delivery of health care in a, in a way that's more coordinated rather than individualistic? Well, you know, uh, you know, I'm delighted you asked that because just over the holidays, uh, I had an epiphany from, and I talked to my, uh, my friend and colleague, Michael, uh, Porter, and he described his own sort of intellectual progress uh, over over a few decades, and and he described you know that you know in business school and in medical school you know we begin by learning cases and we learn about how complicated everything is and how special and unique and you get the message every single situation is different every single patient is different and you just sort of accumulate experience and you go into difficult situations and you have the judgment to wing it and figure out the right thing to do. Uh, that's the old way of learning. 
Then at the other extreme, there's the academic uh, world where you're trying to write papers where exposure A is associated with outcome B, and you end up having to simplify everything. And uh, so you end up with, on one hand, information that's too complicated to be to really tell you what to do in any situation, and on the other hand, information that's too simple to tell you what to do. And, and what uh, they're both useful, but the, uh, uh, they're not useful enough. And so what Porter figured out in the 80s, really, is that what's, there's something in between that's needed, and that's frameworks. You know, frameworks of enduring relationships, fundamental relationships, which are likely to be valid in almost any situation. And that's, uh, you know, that's what his fa famous five forces model was probably the first really prominent example of that. You know, our hope in the article we just wrote in Harvard Business Review is that there's six components of strategy, you know, three of which are fantastically represented by the London Stroke Initiative, uh, will be something like that, fundamental relationships that as younger people, you know, remodel the healthcare system, they will know to emphasize, like the development of teams focused on patients o over episodes of care, you know, measurement, you know, and, uh, you, know, it, you know, consolidating volume uh, over, you know, the various locations. Uh, we hope that the, getting those themes that constitute a framework, you know, will become part of what students learn. Yes, thanks. Dr. Lee, I asked this question as a politician. You told us about the new legislation uh, which has just been introduced by a Democrat but with cross-party support and you made a point about uh, this is still possible even in a political situation in America which is often polarized as, as indeed uh, our politics here in the UK are often polarized. Can you tell us about the factors that made possible this cross-party agreement on uh, the new approach uh, towards dealing with chronic disease treatment? Well, and, you know, I think there's a long way between proposing legislation and passage of the legislation and, and real implementation. Uh, but I think that um, there are, there's agreement below the surface of, uh, on, on many things. And, you know, there, uh, you know even, in the United States, you know, on the surface, uh, you know, politicians don't like to talk about uh, end-of-life care because uh, there's a, you know, a, you know, a very conservative segment that uh, has invoked the term death squads, which has made it very difficult for any politician to talk about it. Below the surface, you know, I know firsthand that there are uh, plenty of senators and congressmen uh, who, you know, in, in both parties, really understand that, that compassionate end-of-life care is a hugely important issue. So uh, some of this work is below the surface. But I think that, you know, Senator Wyden and, uh, you know, has been there a while, and he has, you know, he has worked in a bipartisan way, and, you know, he has been burned politically, uh, for bipartisan work, reaching across the aisle to uh, propose uh, Medicare reform with uh, Paul Ryan, but he, uh, but he's, he was able to put together a, a group in, in both the House and the Senate of some Democrats and some Republicans, and enlist some healthcare deliverers and academics like Michael Porter and me to come and develop legislation. And he's putting forth something that seems pretty non-ideological and pretty common sense. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it'll be all downhill from here. <laughs> look forward to hearing how it goes. Well, Dr. Lee, thank you very much for your time, and I'm very sorry to get you up so early, and uh, thanks for your words of wisdom, and, uh, and also thank you for being so generous in your words about what's happened in London and the stroke care, and uh, what we're trying to do is is replicate that in other disciplines and uh, and if you wouldn't mind we will keep you informed of our progress and maybe intermittently seek your advice and thoughts as this commission uh, goes on and I think we're planning to report sometime in summer and uh, and we'll keep 
keep in contact with you. I'm very keen to explore areas of prevention and well-being at some stage, which is not part of the remit of this group, but uh, we're discussing that next week. But I may come back to you on that as well, if that's, if that's possible. Yes, that's an option. Great, this is a great interest to me, and Michael Porter and I are actually writing an article on that topic now that hopefully in a week and a half I'll be smarter than I am now, so maybe the timing will be right. Much indeed. Have a, have, a, have a good day, as they say in the U.S. Thank That's you. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> that, was, that was good. It's always nice to be recognized and acknowledged, S sadly. Uh, Professor Rudd is not here, of the work done by, uh, by, uh, by leaders in policy.